not a whole lot of scoring in the conference semi-final. Um, only seven goals in leg one of these four games. And nobody actually scored more than two goals. The only team that scored two goals was the Portland Timbers in the Cascadia Derby. And all the winning teams in this first leg have only won by a margin of one goal. Nobody have won a margin more than two goals. So, in many ways, all of these games were very cagey and very tight. And I think the reason why that is the case is because nobody want to go home. Nobody want to have the their first leg that pretty much has determined their season. And nobody want to just get blown out early so that the second leg pretty much does not matter and their season is over and as a resort that's why you get all these kind of low scoring and all these kind kind of just very defensive kind of game uh but in some way it is good the fact that it is tight for all four of these games which means that it is really all to play for for all four of these matchup and you know even though teams that are currently do not have an advantage heading in the second leg they're still in a very good position however if you ask a red bulls fan that probably will not be the case they will just tell you that it feels like it's groundhog day again and i don't disagree with that i mean they lost one nothing to the columbus crew and i knew coming into this matchup this was going to be problematic for the Red Bulls because the crew has their number, not just this season, but in the past. And the the way that Greg Berhalter puts his system, it just clearly works whenever he tried to play against the Red Bulls. And there were the rear team that is able to bypass that Red Bull press. And in this game, it would... It shows once again. Although, to be fair, this game, you know, early on in the first half, let's just say that it was very disjointed. I mean, it looked like both teams didn't know what to do with the ball. And, you know, it feels like both teams was just playing it way too safe. It's almost like an MLS Cup Final where both teams just had that butterfly feelings for the first 20 minutes. And it takes a while to get into the group. That's what it felt like in the first half in this game. However, the difference of this game was in the second half and... You know, Zardes, of course, scored that goal in the 61st minute, which gives him now 20 goals this season. But guess who was the guy that assisted Zardes' goal? Oh, yeah, that's right. It's Pipa Higuain. It's that man, again, where where he always tends to show up in the big occasion. And once again, in this game, he shows up. And the thing about Higuain is that he didn't even play the full 90 minutes. He only played the entire second half because he did play 120 minutes in the midweek and since he is 34 years old and people forget that he's actually 34 years old and he's actually pretty old but when you look at how he's playing it feels like he's still in his prime um he still made a huge impact for this team and that was really the difference in this game when Federico Higuain came on this Columbus crew team feel more energetic going forward and eventually they did grab that goal but it's also a combination of the fact that I don't know what in the world were the Red Bulls doing in the second half like I know the first half they were kind of disjointed but they did have majority of the chances to potentially go one nothing in the second half it they just it feels like they never showed up like everybody on this team almost forgot that they are the best team in the league and yeah I mean, I, I just, I don't know what's going on with the, the Red Bulls. Like, they literally decide to kind of just give the ball to the crew. The crew was really dictating the the pace of the game in the second half. And I was, I was just shocked of how bad the Red Bulls look in the second half. Although, to be fair, if you're a Red Bulls fan and you've been seeing this team perform in the playoffs, that shouldn't be a very shocking thing because that's been kind of the... The, the way the Red Bulls has been playing for the last couple of years whenever they get into the playoffs. And I thought this year was going to be different because this year they got record amount of points and they won the supporter shield. And you think that they finally got over the hump. And in this game, it clearly shown that they definitely haven't got over the hump. And let's also not forget about another heroic 
player in this game that saved the crew. No pun intended, by the way. And that, of course, is Zach Steffen. So, last week, Zach Steffen, of course, was the hero of this team because he saved a couple of crucial penalties, including the one that Wayne Rutney and Lucho Costa take. This time, he made another, another couple of big saves in this game, but none other than what happened in stoppage time when the ball was delivered into the box. BWP was wide open. He had a free header, and you would think that 99 out of 100 times, BWP would put that away. But instead, Zach Steffen with his big hand able to save that header from BWP. And to be fair, that header from from BWP wasn't really hit very well. But the way that Zach Steffen is able to save that, I mean, that is just, that is incredible. I do not know how in the world BWP does not put away that. I guess maybe that's, that's the playoff form of BWP where he usually does not show up and in this game it was another example of it and in fact pretty much the whole team in this game did not show up for this match and you know if you're the Red Bulls yeah this is not good and I know they have a second leg to play and I know they're only down one nothing but they didn't get an away goal in this so if Columbus get an away goal in the next game then Columbus could potentially move on and you know we've seen this story before where the Red Bulls they lost the first leg and then in the second leg they either try to come back which eventually they fell short or they didn't get an away goal on the road and in the second leg that really kind of haunt them back because the their opponent got an away goal and they lost out on the away goal this looks really similar and it's so disappointing that this looks very similar and it has to be agonizing if you're a Red Bulls fan like you thought this was it this was finally the season where you broke that curse of them just for whatever reason cannot perform very well and always choke in the playoffs and it looks like it's happening again and what do you know that it would happen to the team that always tends to beat you in the playoffs and as for the crew this is the best case scenario you would, that I think the crew would ever have. I mean, besides maybe score a couple of more goals, which you know would have been better. And I think if Higuain was in this entire game, then maybe the crew could have scored a couple of more goals because he's been the main source. And so far, the Red Bulls have found no way to stop Pipa Higuain in this game. And you know, this is the best case scenario for them because now they head to Red Bull Arena and I'm pretty sure Greg Berhalter is going to use that same system that he used in this game. And it's just up to the Red Bulls and up to Chris Armas to figure out a way to to change his tactics and break down this very compact crew team. And from what I've seen from this game, it does not really tells me that they're going to be very successful in the next game unless Chris Armas does change something in the next match or else it's another year of disappointment for the Red Bulls uh, but moving on into the Cascadia Derby so the hype of this game definitely live live up um, the, the Timbers of course won 2-1 in this game uh, goals in this game Rui Diaz got the a dream start for the Sounders in the 10th minute but then the Timbers immediately responds with uh, Jeremy Ibobasi, which by the way, Ibobasi, this is a guy that I haven't mentioned a lot in in most of these previews and reviews that I've done, but he's actually having a pretty good year. And you could kind of argue that he could maybe be in a conversation of making into the national team. I mean, he's been kind of sharing that role with Samuel Armateros, and it looks like Savarese decided that, you know, we're going to go, I'm going to decide to go. Ibovasi instead of Armateros because he has more trust on the youngster and that trust clearly paid off in this game when he scored in the 17th minute and by the way I know Sounders fans are not going to be happy with this goal because they thought for sure that it was offside and when you look at the angle from the TV it definitely looked like he was offside however if you actually like put a pen between Ibovasi and the last Sounders defender it looks like Ibovasi was just on side just barely and you could maybe argue that maybe he was offside by like a toe but it 
just too close to call for for it to be overturned. And speaking of overturn, we actually had a VAR incident early in this game. And I'll tell you what, the Sounders had a nightmare of a first half. And it's not just the scoreline that they have a nightmare, but they lost two of their biggest players. And these two players could really break the Sounders season. Uh, first of all, they lost Christian Rodin in the sixth minute. And ironically, Christian Rodin injured himself when he was trying to win a penalty in the sixth minute when he was trying to stick a leg out of Jeff Antonella to try to win that penalty. And instead, the referee looked at VAR and it, they said that it's not enough deemed to be a penalty. So, in some way, I, can say, I could kind of say that's kind of karma for him in terms of him trying to, to do a little bit of of a cheating job there and instead he got himself injured although I'm pretty sure Sounders fan will be mad for if I'm saying that because you know Rodan did kind of injure himself in that moment and then just as you thought things couldn't get worse for the Sounders then they lost their their center back char Chad Marshall to a leg injury and Chad Marshall actually had to stretch her off in this game and when you see a player gets stretcher off of the field that usually does not mean very good and it's kind of sad to see that Chet Marshall does get stretcher off in this game and potentially it looks like he might have suffered a torn ACL uh, I haven't heard any report of what exactly the injury is but if that is the case then that maybe could be the last time we ever see him in a Sounders jersey because Marshall is 34 years old and you know that as you get older, those injuries, especially the serious one, like a torn ACL, is is even harder to recover than it is. It's going to take longer to recover than when you're like in your 20s. And you wonder, is that the last time we ever see Marshall in a Sounder jersey? And I hope it isn't. I mean, it's not just for a Sounders fan sake, but also for an MOS fan like me where... You know, Chad Marshall, he's been one of the best defenders ever in MLS. The way that, that he has influenced this league and the way that, you know, what he has done to this league and in terms of being just one of the best defender that we ever had, it really sucks if this is the way that he ends his careers. And hopefully he'll, he'll be back soon and recover from whatever that injury is. And I think most likely he won't be available in this return leg game between the Sounders and the Timbers. And that is a huge blow in terms of that back line. Um, but, you know, the Timbers, of course, got, a, got another goal in the 29th minute by Sebastian Blanco. Who, you know, this season, I don't have to say, say it anymore other than the fact that he has just been having an incredible year. And this goal pretty much shows what a year he's been having. I mean, he's able to dance a couple of Sounders defender before slotting that ball in. I mean, that is an incredible goal for him. And after that, the Timbers really kind of dominate things. And you thought that the Timbers potentially would get the third goal. But then for whatever reason, heading into the second half, they kind of stopped playing. And they kind of really took the foot off the gas in terms of the attacking force and kind of just sit deep. And I don't know if that was what Savarisi wants this team to do, but it's kind of odd the fact that why do they not decide to attack the Sounders when the Sounders are already down two of their best player in this squad. And the fact that since the Sounders got that away goal, you want to stretch this lead so that you make sure when the return leg the Sounders doesn't just need one goal to event because as of now the Sounders if they can get one goal in this return leg at CenturyLink then the Sounders of course will be moving forward and you would think that if that is going to happen you gotta have to question Savarisi's tactics in the second half of why exactly they didn't really go for it I mean they kind of did go for it near the end and you know Stefan Fry made a couple of big saves but you kind of thought that they probably should have got go for it and really just play with no fear for the rest of the game. But instead, they just kind of set back. And I guess maybe it's because they don't want to concede that second goal for, for
from the Seattle Sounders because if they can see that second goal, then they could be in a bit of a trouble conceding two away goal. But at the same time, they just lost their best defenders and they just also lost their best attacker. So why do you have to be really concerned and trying to sit back and hopefully absorb the pressure? And the Sounders in the second half, despite all that pressure that they have, they just couldn't really capitalize. Um, you know, they had a couple of good chances. Uh, Antonella made a couple of big saves. But, you know, when you look at this game, like I said in the preview, this game kind of determined wh what happened in the first leg. And it will tell us the story of what we're going to see in the second leg. And it kind of doesn't. I feel like this is still very kind of even. You know, I still think that the Sounders are still in it, even though they do lost two of their best players. And they actually look a little bit better when they lose those two big piece players than they did for majority part of the first half. So you wonder, this Sounders team is not going to go quiet in that second leg. And, you know, we'll see how Portland will respond on the road. Remember, Portland has already won once at century length field this this year so we'll see how the second leg is gonna play out but moving on into this match where this was a bloodbath uh so nycfc and elena uh, where elena won one nothing in this game uh remedy with the only goal in this game and this was not only his first goal of the season but that was actually his first ever goal as a professional soccer player I mean, what a time to score your first ever goal as your professional soccer player. And it was a very kind of scrappy goal, which also kind of summarized this game. I mean, the ball was like sitting near the near the edge of the post after Sean Johnson made a, a save from Martinez. And then Remedy basically just poked that one in. And, you know, overall, this was a really physical matchup. Like, there was so many fouls. And you kind of mistaken that this was what you expect in the Cascadia Derby where it was very physical and challenge was going to be flying in. There was going to be bad blood between both of these teams. But instead, this one was actually a very clean game. This one was that kind of type of a game where there was just bad blood between both of these teams. Like, I kind of feel like maybe the reason why that is the case is, you know, if one of these teams lose this leg, then you could say that they choke this year i mean if nycfc lose this you know it will go back to once again their failure to move on into the conference semi-final and the fact that this team just can't go deep in the playoffs and if atlanta lose this then yeah they will be labeled as a choker of not only choking the 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 supporter shield but also choking their chances of winning a trophy before tata Matinho leaves and you know, Atlanta, of course, with a very gritty win. And, you know, the question or the, the story coming into this game obviously had to deal with whether or not if Almiron was ready to play in this game. And it turns out he did did play in this game. He actually started in this game, play about an hour in this game before he got subbed off. And he actually did pretty well in this game. He, he was... He made a couple of big impact for this Atlanta team and he looked like he, he scored the first goal for Atlanta right I think around the 24th minute but then it was called back because originally in the beginning of the development play which was a corner uh, when Almiron basically trying to take a short corner to Lorenovitz, Lorenovitz basically passed back to Almiron but Almiron was an, in an offside position because he was near the corner flag and it's kind of weird that we don't see that more hap that happen more often whenever a short corner is kind of taken but yeah that's a big mistake there from Lorenovitz and it is a good job that the referee of course catch that I know Atlanta fans are going to be upset about that call but it's the correct call I mean Almiron was clearly offside when Lorenovitz played the ball back to him so yeah, good catch there by the referee. And also, the referee did also did a very good good job um, catching a a goal that, that NYCFC thought that they, they score and thought they got an equalizer when um, it looks like it was going to be 1-1. But 
they call a foul on David Villa, which he was trying to like do a kind of spectacular kind of kick. And he, a, a couple of times, he just tried to go with the spectacular. I mean, I know that David Villa is an incredible player, but you don't need to go for the spectacular. All you need to do is just make it simple and not be too cute. And in this game, he at time he just was just being way too cute. And with him trying to go with a bicycle kick, unfortunately, he caught one of the Atlanta player. And yeah, that of course is definitely a foul. But overall, when you look at this game, obviously advantage Atlanta because they got the away goal. NYCFC didn't get a goal in this game, and it's now up to NYCFC heading into Mercedes-Benz Stadium, where they need to win that game and Atlanta of course are very good at home but we just seen what happened in this game where NYCFC was also good at home and they lost so I wouldn't say NYCFC is completely out of it but Atlanta certainly has a big advantage considering the fact that I think the next game they would have Almiron back in in full strength and I think after Almiron came off in this game you can see how NYCFC was really just putting a lot of pressure on Atlanta and it just kind of also emphasized of how an Atlanta team without Al Miron is basically a kind of mediocre kind of team uh, but moving on into the final game that I get I'm gonna be talking about uh, so this game was a game of bangers because both of these goals were certainly worthy of of the goal of the playoff kind of contention. Uh, first of all, Rusnak, of course, scoring in the 51st minute. Uh, Rusnak actually try was actually giving the ball to Demir Krylak, and then Krylak basically can kind of chest that one back to him on a volley, and then Rusnak basically hit that one on the volley. I mean, what is it with RSL in terms of all these incredible goals? I mean, we saw. In that LAFC RSL match, Demir Krylak scoring the karate kit kick kind of goal, and now this game it looked like a kind of Barcelona tiki taka style of goal. I mean, it, it that was just incredible by Rusnak, and it's a shame that he won't be available for the next game because he did pick up his second yellow card. And yes, yellow card accumulation does count in the playoffs. And once you get two yellow card in the playoffs, then you are officially suspended for the next match. And of course, Rusnak did pick up that yellow card in this game. And he already had one coming in to this matchup. And then Diego Rubio responds with his own bangers. Although, to be fair, this goal probably shouldn't have happened if Nick Raimondo, who was pretty good in this game, he made a couple of big saves, but... He made this one big mistake where he was trying to put the ball upfield. The ball was deflected off of one of the Sporting KC player, And then Rubio gathered the ball. And he basically just scored that one from 25 yards out. I mean, in some way, that is kind of Ramondo's fault. The fact that that, that clearance that he had was partially blocked. But you got to give credit to Rubio. I mean, he still had a lot to do to potentially capitalize on that mistake and keep in mind Rubio when he scored this goal he was only on for 55 seconds he just got subbed on in a couple of seconds ago and he literally made an instant impact and when you look at this game you know RSL would be really disappointed not just the fact that they conceded that away goal but it's also the fact that they control this game and yet they still could not able to win against Sporting KC. Sporting KC actually only had 33 possession of of the or 33 percent possession of this game and that is not only the lowest this season that they ever had but that's the lowest since 2015 and that is just not the way that a Peter Vermees Sporting KC team play and you would think that RSL would be able to capitalize on a Sporting KC team that was very lackluster but Unfortunately, that key mistake from Ramaldo could potentially come back to haunt them. And for Sporting KC, this is what I've been talking about, about this team. This team is just different from the past Sporting KC team. If this was the past Sporting KC team from a couple of years ago, or even just last year, this team would have lost this game easily. 
But because of the resilience that this team has shown, and even when they're not playing very well, they still somehow find a way to get a resort. There you go. It's shown once again in this match. And now they're heading into the return leg with certainly a huge advantage because they got the away goal and they're very good at Children Mercy Park. But don't forget RSL, they did get a resort down in Children Mercy Park earlier this season. But they will not have Rusnak for that game. And Rusnak is a crucial player for them. I mean, besides Jamar Krylak, I think Rusnak has been one of the most influential player for this RSL team in the playoffs. And we shall see how that is going to go for RSL and what will Mike Pecky do in terms of trying to adjust his tactics that now that he does not have Rusnak for that second leg game. But yeah, that is pretty much it for the review of this first leg. And like I said, it is a very tight kind of first leg with just not a lot of goals, but also just not a lot of blowouts, which means that heading into the second leg, it's really all to play for. And also, this game between the Sounders and the Timbers, this game actually kicks off on Thursday because apparently for the second time this season, there is a conflict in terms of the schedule at Century Link Field. I heard this time they have an auto show there, so that's why they had to play the game on Thursday. And the rest of these game is going to be happening on Sunday. So I'm going to do the preview probably either on Wednesday or Thursday. And I'll also do the review of this game right after this match. Um, and then I'll do the review for these other free games on Sunday but yeah hope you guys enjoyed this video if you do make sure you guys leave a like smash that subscribe button and yeah I will see you guys next time